the, the intent of the company, what we're focused on is developing magnet and heavy rare earth supply for, for Western end users. Um, so if we move on um, through our disclaimer, um, the company's in looking at an integrated vision, um, integrated into the life cycle of rare earth. So we have a large iron consorption clay deposit uh, in Uganda, the Makutu Rare Earth Project. We presently own 60% of the asset. Um, we're working through a mining license application process now. Uh, being a, an ionic absorption clay, it's a low capital development, near surface, uh, produces a value, um, value added product, a mixed rare earth carbonate rich in both magnet and heavy rare earths with no radionuclides. Um, it's scalable and we've got a lot of exploration upside. Because of the type of product and the nature of the, the dominance that China has on the supply chain, uh, we've been looking at a downstream uh, a refinery to uh, separate uh, and refine our individual magnet rare earths into um, the oxides that can be then deployed into metal making, alloy making, magnet making. Um, we've identified a, a strategy into the US and uh, working on a scoping study, which we're hoping to complete shortly. Um, and then the, fir the third uh, aspect of the company is magnet recycling. So recycling end of life permanent magnets um, and we're building a demonstration plant at the moment in the UK. Um, Commercialising that, we uh, expect the ability to roll that out um, and completing the circular economy of rare earths, which we see as being very important now to a number of, uh, of stakeholders. Moving on, um, just a quick snapshot of the corporate, uh, corporate snapshot of the company. Um, roughly market caps around 103 million. Um, at the end of uh, December, we had nearly 20 million in the bank. Um, moving on. Um, so that's the nature of the, the supply chains that exist today, um, completely dominated by China. Um, and what we're trying to do is provide an alternative on both magnet and heavy rare earths um, to, to Western supply chains, which are trying to form at the moment. Um, so with regards to the Makutu asset and potentially refinery um, in the US, um, we can start to provide some, some alternative options for some stakeholders who are keen to explore uh, decoupling from, from dependence on China. But realistically, there's still tremendous investment that needs to happen on metal making and magnet manufacturing. Um, and then the third aspect of the company, recycling is an area that's completely dominated by China. And we think that we're in a position to, uh, to provide, again, some optionality for, for partners there. Moving on, um, one of the biggest um, tailwinds that we're the beneficiary, uh, the beneficiary of at the moment is the geopolitical uh, demand to decouple from China. Um, so very strong support from both the you know, stakeholders uh, within the US and, and the European Commission on helping to facilitate access and supply of both magnet and heavy rare earths for, for these supply chains. Um, further moving on with the recent um, European Critical Raw Material Act, again, we're in a very unique position where we produce, um, or we will produce um, both magnet and heavy rare earths, which fall under this new strategic raw material classification. Um, and so demand is, is growing. Um, uh, on, on mining processing um, of our product, but, but importantly also the recycling opportunity. So again, um, the ground uh, groundswell of support for the offering from, from the company is, is in a very good place. Um, if we move on, um, you know, this is the, the greatest supply chain, the roles that we think we can play within ionic rare earths, the roles that other uh, participants in magnet supply chains will need to, um, to bring um, to, to operation and we're engaging with, with several groups now on metal making and alloy making and magnet making um, so that we can be part of those new supply chains that are forming now. Moving on. Um, so now just to explore a little bit more uh, about Makutu itself. Uh, so we've recently completed our stage one DFS. Um, we've received tremendous support from the Ugandan government um, where we've got flagship project status um, and working now through the, the final stages of a mining license application. Um, so if we move on, um, the recently res um, announced results of our stage one feasibility study indicated um, for the first of six tenements, um, we've got a 35 year life. So it's a very large near surface development, capital development of 120 million, 
Um, it's got a very robust internal rate of return um, and producing a product that's rich in both mag and heavy rare earths. So with that kind of product, um, we had, have had significant interest uh, from end users um, across both North America and, and Europe, looking to get access to our product to go into these new supply chains. Uh, if we moving, move on, um, the project location itself. So we're in Uganda, um, about a thousand kilometers from the port of Mombasa. The project site itself stretches across 37 kilometers long. Um, we're near the mouth of the Nile of Ginger, which is approximately 120 kilometers from uh, Kampala. Um, available infrastructure is extremely good, um, and that's going to support the low capital development of Kutu. So if we move on, um, just a, a quick snapshot of the, the mineralization, um, the resource and the mining license application focuses on that red central area. We have six other tenements um, and progressively each of those tenements will move towards their own individual mining license application. Uh, so we've got a large resource, uh, potential to double that again with an exploration target that's currently defined. Um, and uh, you know, if we look at sort of the, the eastern tenements and northwest tenements, they are highly prospective for additional mineralization. And so uh, uh, hopefully uh, later this year we'll be in, in the um, position to, to deploy drilling um, to uh, define how much larger the project has the potential to become. We move on. Um, just to cover off a little bit on, on magnet recycling and what we're doing in Belfast. Um, so recently, uh, September last year, we got a grant from the government, um, the UK government, which is 1.7 million pounds. We, um, we acquired this technology out of Queen's University, Belfast, um, and we're in the process of building a demonstration plant now. If we move on um, to the next slide, we've already been through the process of running pilot plants and making high purity oxides. We've set up a facility now that, that hosts the pilot plant analytical facilities and, and hydrometallurgical labs and now in the process of building our demonstration plant and commissioning that plant with a view to recycling 30 tonnes of magnets, producing 10 tonnes of oxides, which we'll then be able to use on, on building those supply chain relationships. Um, so we're about to enter a very exciting phase for, for what's coming with, with ionic technologies. Moving on, um, you know, the activity over the last few years, you know, it's been a, a steady progress towards de-risking Makutu um, we've added capability on, on magnet recycling and, and if we look to, to 2023 um, and near term sort of benefits, we, we're going to finalise our mining licence application um, and the award of the mining licence, which we expect is going to come through in the second quarter of this year. Uh, we are in discussions with our partners on increasing the ownership of Makutu um, and we've publicly committed now um, and started work on our demonstration plan. So that demonstration plant at Makutu will enable us to produce the mixed rare earth carbonate product that we can take into uh, these supply chain discussions that are underway now. Um, and so, you know, a very exciting phase of development at Makutu as we work towards de-risking Makutu ahead of a final investment decision, which we're hoping to complete later this year. On the magnet recycling, we'll be a producer of, of magnet rare earths um, by the end of the second quarter this year. Uh, which again is a, is a big milestone for the company. Um, we're working on that scoping study. We've got a preferred location selected in the US um, and working with groups on, on what that looked like along with stakeholders at, at government level. Um, and beyond that, uh, you know, as we define and, and develop and bring the KUTU to production and completion of the feasibility study, we've had a lot more interest and appetite on the individual basket and how that can be uh, deployed. Uh, in these uh, new, uh, new, new supply chains. If we move on to the, the next slide, I suppose this is where we see uh, Ionic at the moment. Um, we've completed our feasibility study and with the, um, the milestones that we expect to come online shortly, you know, we do expect that um, you know, we, we start to work, move into a, a phase of growth. And uh, you know, it's very exciting for the company. We've, we've worked through a lot of work over the last four years to be in a position to develop Makutu into production. Um, and so very exciting phase uh, as the company moves from you know, explorer now to developer and, uh, and shortly in the UK, a producer of, of magnet rare earths. We move on. Um, if we just look at a high level value proposition of Ionic, uh, you know, it's a large, Makutu itself is a very large deposit. 
um, it will get larger and it's going to produce those magnet and heavy rare earths that are very difficult to source in other, other rare earth deposits. Um, low capital development and uh, the ability to, to produce those materials that will underpin um, net zero carbon uh, initiatives globally. Um, so it's a very strategic asset um, and uh, you know, with those geopolitical tensions, um, a very strong wind at our back. Um, we are looking and we, we're zeroing in on the opportunity to further extract value from the project and the product through further refining um, and relationships on bringing that product into supply chains that are emerging. And uh, with the magnet recycling exposure, we see an ability to move very quickly on global deployment. And so we've got several things um, on the cards there. Um, and that's effectively a, a very quick overview of the line of rare earths. And uh, yeah, uh, over to you, Tim. Thanks, thanks, Tim. Um, bang on time. We always appreciate that. Um, now, now you spoke about for, for those investors that don't know the company. You spoke about sixty percent ownership of your Makutu project and potentially the ability to buy some more. Who, who owns the other forty percent? Yeah, so partners in Renzori Rare Metals, uh, South African and Ugandan groups who've been um, effectively involved in this project all the way back to um, it was initially discovered back in uh, twenty eleven. Um, so long-term stakeholders that have been involved in taking the project as far as they could. That created an opportunity for Ionic to come in um, in mid-2019, and we've been working through a program to, to expedite the Kutu into production to support mining license applications and put, put us in the position now where we're at the, at the, you know, the front edge of discussions now of, uh, of being a, a key participant in supplying heavy rare earths to Western end users. And, and obviously your relationship with the Ugandan government and particularly the kind of Ministry of Industry, uh, of Energy rather, and Mineral Development is kind of critical to the success. How's your engagement with, with the Ugandan government been uh, and how's that progressing? So, um, you know, we, we acquired our initial interest in the project at the start of, of COVID. Um, and through COVID, it, it, it facilitated our requirement to spend more money on Ugandan capability. We built very good relationships with um, both government departments, stakeholders within the Ugandan government, um, where they're buying in. They're buying into what it is we're doing and the opportunity that, that Makutu represents to help build a mining industry in Uganda. Um, so tremendous support, stakeholder engagement, environmental permits are all being uh, approved in Uganda and uh, you know we expect the mining license to be awarded um, in this quarter. That was my next question. Uh, you stole my thunder. Um, so. In regards to the demonstration plant, the commissioning of that's underway, when can we expect to see some first sort of test production? Uh, so uh, so we've got two demonstration plants. So one at Makutu where we're in construction now of a, a phased approach to make mixed rare earth carbonate for, for end users. Um, so an, our anticipated production of, of product, we expect to have product in the third quarter of this year um, and start large scale production for, uh, for downstream users uh, later this year. Um, at In Belfast, uh, we're in commissioning now for our demonstration plan on magnet recycling. Um, we expect we'll have oxides, high purity magnet, um, magnet rare earth oxides uh, by the end of this quarter again. Um, and we're in discussions now with potential supply chain partners on converting those, those oxides now to metals, alloys and magnets. So it's a, it's a very exciting time for the company. Uh, and a couple more, Tim, if you don't mind. Um, any updates on the scoping study for refinery in the USA? Yeah, so we, uh, we are now in possession of a lot of really strategic information about the value and, and uh, I suppose, opportunity for Ionic with our own standalone refinery. We've got a preferred site located. We're finalising the, the study itself. We've got some final test work which has been completed. Um, and then we'll take that information internally and work out how we can best leverage that information um, to Ionic's advantage as we progress uh, discussions on potentially a US facility. Um, there's still a little bit of work to be done around that. Um, I think we're in a pretty good position though to understand how much value and upside it is, is in this space. I think the other thing is that we've been doing a lot of work in this, this sector, which a lot of our peers have been able to leverage off, um, which to some degree diminishes our strategic advantage. Uh, so we'll, we'll review um, what we make public when we make public um, to maximise its, its benefit to the company. And, and just finally, Tim, there's a question on your, your financing options. Um, obviously, that you, there's strong 
tailwinds uh, globally from governments. There's a lot of funding from governments. Where does kind of Uganda fit in that picture potentially for kind of funding options? Yeah, look, so I think um, what, what should be understood is that, um, you know, there, there is tremendous investment that occurs in Uganda at the moment. I think, um, you know, numbers we've had quoted from key stakeholders within the US government is around about a billion dollars worth of aid investment that goes into Uganda from, from the US. Um, and with regards to the, the European Commission, they've identified Uganda as one of the six countries where they'd like to prioritise investment um, in Africa. So we are in a very good spot with some you know, strategic end users um, who are desperate to get access to the product and uh, the appetite to invest in Uganda is, uh, is already there. Um, it's just a matter of de-risking the project to support primary investment decisions. Tim, thanks. We, that's all we have time for. Thanks for your time. Uh, we'll follow with interest and get you back on later in the year. Thank you, Tim.